Welcome to this lecture on natural language processing. Natural language processing is one of my favorite topics in the whole of data science and machine learning and I hope I get you a bit excited about the topic as well. The motivating example for this lecture is machine translation. I think that everybody in this class has used the machine translation system already, whether it be DeepL or Google Translate. But even though it's really easy for us to use them nowadays, you kind of have to think about just how hard it is to develop a system that can do this. What we have here is a paper from Badenauer, um, who implemented uh, an encoder-decoder neural network that takes English sentences and then represents them in the right way to then generate French sentences with an encoder that encodes the English sentence and a decoder that decodes the French sentence. And what's really important here is to consider the whole idea of representation. What we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to think about how can we take text and how can we then put that into a representation that is suitable for the machine learning algorithms that we already learned. So this idea has been around since at least the 17th century where people like Leibniz or Descartes thought about relating words between languages for machine translation applications. We talked about the Turing test in one of the earlier lectures. That's also, of course, about language understanding. Another important milestone in the history of natural language processing is Noam Chomsky's syntactic structures in linguistics. He introduced this idea of a universal grammar, which is a rule-based system of syntactic structures, which was really important in our idea of programming languages. And another important example for language understanding is provided by Terry Vinograd. And he introduced the system called Schrdeldu. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But the basic idea of the system is that a user can have a conversation with a computer. And I actually have a nice video of the system. So this was primarily a language parser that allowed users to interact using English terms. So the user instructs the Schrödelu system to move various objects around in this block world and the system knows some relation. So just have a look. So this is the block world. Then the user, for instance, asks what does the box contain, and the system answers the blue pyramid and the blue block. What is the pyramid supported by? And the system can say the box. So here we have language understanding and something we would call logical reasoning. So this is quite an early example from the 1970s. So nowadays we have a lot of these so-called voice assistant or smart home applications. You know Siri, you know Alexa, you know Google Home. But these are still quite limited, right? They can obey to a number of well-defined, predefined problems uh, and commands, but they can't really understand language in the way a human being can. And that's because it's still a very hard problem to actually understand language and to deal with the whole ambiguity of language. And I hope I can give you a bit of an idea about this in the course of this lecture. So one thing that's nice in this whole open source Python ecosystem is that there's a lot of building blocks. So doing data science becomes a bit like playing Lego. So we have tools for text processing, for instance, the Natural Language Toolkit, word to vec Spacey, and we have visualization tools like D3JS, HiCharts, or the Google Chart API. There are topic modeling techniques that are implemented in libraries like Jensen. And there's, of course, our machine learning library, Scikit-learn. And these can then be combined to solve quite complex problems. Here, and this is one of my favorite examples, is a paper called Research Methods in the Age of Digital Journalism, Massive Scale Automated Analysis of News Content, Topics, Style, and Gender by Flanuas and others. 
And what the authors of that paper did is they looked at 2.5 million articles from almost 500 different English language news outlets. So these were data sources like Reuters and the New York Times. And then they automatically annotated all these articles, these 2.5 million articles, into 15 topic areas. And the topics were then compared regarding the readability, the linguistic subjectivity, and gender imbalances. Let's consider the linguistic subjectivity first. So what they did here is they operationalized linguistic subjectivity as the adjectives in the text and the valence of the adjectives. So for instance, happy is a very positive word and sad is a very negative word. So they had this database called SentiWordNet in which for each word we have a ranking whether this is happy or sad and then they combined that for all the adjectives and computed whether this topic has a high linguistic subjectivity or a low linguistic subjectivity. And I'm making a highlight here. What you can see is that fashion has quite a high linguistic subjectivity, whereas politics, elections, and business have quite low linguistic subjectivity. And you can see here on the bottom that they had an hypothesis based on this. They said that maybe the low level of political interest and engagement could be connected to the lack of subjectivity. What they also did is they looked at the gender of the people that are mentioned in the text. So for this, they had a machine learning system that identified names, and they had a database of male and female names, and they ranked this. And you can see that the higher up, the more male biased the reporting is. And you can see that only in fashion we have an approximate equal representation of men and women, whereas in sports it has a very, very strong bias for men. So what you can see in the quote on the bottom is that females only account for between 7 to 25% of coverage in sports. So this was one example of how these techniques can be used. But why is it so difficult to pass natural language? This is a famous and often used example to illustrate just the ambiguity of human language. This is a sentence that reads, fruit flies like a banana. And this is one particular parsing. So here we try to find which is the noun, which is the verb, which, is, which are the adjectives. So we try to find which is the noun, which is the verb, and which is the adjective in the sentence. And what you probably notice if you look at this closer is that this, this is not the only interpretation of that sentence, right? We can say that the fruit flies like a banana, but we can also say that fruit flies, like the animal, they do like eating a banana. So this is a complex problem because we have these symbols, and these symbols have meaning associated, but how can we teach this to a computer? How can we represent the language in a way that is accessible to a computer. I make some operationalizations. Whenever I say word in this context, I mean tokens that are separated by white space, and a corpus is always a collection of documents. You find that a lot in the literature, it's just words that you need to learn. And going back to the example here, is we have to remember that we just use a lot of context when we're actually interpreting language. We're not just looking at dictionary definitions of the words. We use a lot of context to actually understand what people are talking about. So the first and easiest thing that you need to learn is to open and read files. And that's comparatively easy in Python. There is an open function that you give a file name, and then you have a read lines function. And then you get an array of all the lines in the text. As you can see here, you can just index it and look at the 609th line. You can also use the slicing operator that you've learned before. So you can get a range of sentences. And you can manipulate these sentences in line. So what we're doing here is we're going through 
all the lines in the selection and then we're running the command dot upper on the lines and you can see that they all turn into uppercase so this is really the easiest thing to do right to just load a text file for more complex things we're not going to implement things from scratch but we're going to use two libraries we're going to use the natural language toolkit which is called NLTK and you can just get it through pip install NLTK if you use Anaconda it should already be installed but just in case we need to install it pip install NLTK and Spacey I'm going to explain Spacey in a second the first task that you have to deal with in natural language processing is to tokenize the words and that is taking a sentence taking a bunch of characters and turning them into individual tokens and we have things like isn't in the text that we then have to uh, convert into is not so it's a handy function that allows you to turn a bunch of text into individual tokens that you can then feed into your machine learning algorithm the second thing that we might want to do is to analyze the part of speech text of the different sentences so we have the same sentence here and what the part of speech tagging does is assigning each of the tokens with a label of its function in the sentence and you might remember that from school you have nouns of course you have verbs and you have adjectives and they are and they all have different functions in a sentence and i try to color code this a bit as you can see we have the nouns goal lecture text and processing we have the verbs in green the is and the explain and we have the adjectives like complex and free and depending on your problem it can be a very good pre-processing step to only attend to a subset of the available part of speech tokens as I showed you for the linguistic subjectivity, they only looked at the adjectives, but if you do topic modeling, for instance, it might be good to just look at the nouns, if that's really what you're into. Um, yeah. Here's another technique that's nicely implemented in the natural language toolkit, and that's the so-called named entity recognition. By the way, this is all work in code. You can just really copy and paste that into Python and run it and what you see here is we have text like new york city is the largest city in the united states and then we use the named entity recognition tool that's called ne underscore chunk based on the part of speech tags of our sentence and as you can see and i tried to highlight this again it automatically recognizes new york city like all the different tokens as part of the geopolitical entity new york city and it did the same for the entity united states you can also see on the bottom that it can recognize the names of organizations the names of people the dates time uh, money something related to percentage or facilities and that's one way to cherry pick things from text right you could run this on a large data set and for instance find out who the visa courier is actually writing about now what we've done so far is we looked at the sentence level and what we can do with a sentence oftentimes of course we're dealing with large documents so there's also a variety of ways of representing whole documents to feed them into a machine learning algorithm the simplest is the so-called back of words and what you do here is you have a sentence like it is a puppy and it is extremely cute and you basically just make a list of your vocabulary and you count for each of the words that you've seen how often you've seen it the word the does not occur the word beer does not occur but words like cold and puppy and extremely occur so you're just counting how often each word is part of the sentence and then that is your representation of that particular text this is a count based back of words representation there's also a binarized back of words representation where you don't keep the count but you just have a binary zero the word is not in the text one the word is in the text so an important problem with this approach 
is that back of words throws away a lot of information. So just imagine you have a sentence like a boring movie and not great, and the sentence great movie and not boring in the back of words representation, these sentences would look the same. In practice, back of words works surprisingly well for a variety of problems and it's a very good baseline. So before you start with more complex machine learning algorithms like neural networks, especially recurrent neural networks, it's always good to use this as a simple baseline that you can compare against. One way to mitigate the limitation of that approach are the so-called n-gram. And an n-gram is just a continuous sequence of n items from a given sequence of text or speech. Now, individual words, the individual tokens, that are just unigrams. But often you use more than that. You use so-called bigrams or trigrams, and these are always three words at a time. And what you basically do here is you take three different words and you treat them as if they were one word. So you could, for instance, then do a back of words model on these n-grams and then you would count New York City as an entity or the three words together or Hendrik Hoyer. Um, and that can be quite helpful. And that's already a step towards taking more structure into account when making the predictions. Here is an implementation of the Ngram model using NLTK. You give it your tokens and then you give it the N, the number of grams that you want to have. This is quite easy to do in Python actually, and this is like a very idiomatic way of doing it in Python. Just so you've seen that. So one way to improve on back of words is to use the so-called TFIDF to use a representation based on the term frequency and the inverse document frequency. Because with back of words, we have this problem that there's very common words that kind of overload our measure. So if we, for instance, want to compare how similar two texts are, and we take a back of word representation, then words like the, is, of can actually make a lot of difference because they occur quite frequently. So what you want to do is to account for words that are specific to a sentence, that are specific to a particular document. So what you do is you take the term frequency, and that is the count of a word in the document or a sentence. And we call this TFIJ, that's the frequency of the word J in the document I. And that again can be binary, that can be raw counts, it can also be log scaled or normalized by document's most frequent word. You combine that with the so-called inverse document frequency. And that is the number of documents divided by the count of documents that have a certain term. So IDF is the number of documents over the number of documents that have the word J. And then you just multiply this against each other. You have the term frequency times the inverse document frequency. And empirically, it works much better than just using raw scores. For instance, to compute the similarity between documents or to have machine learning classifiers on documents. Now, another thing that you might want to do when you're dealing with text is to visualize how frequently specific words occur. And here's a nice code example using the library yellow brick, um, where we're doing a frequency distribution visualizer. So you take a count vectorizer and you initialize that. Then you do a fit transform on the data. And then you just take these docs and the feature names that the vectorizer gives you and you give that to a frequency distant visualizer from yellow brick and you call the fit and the proof function and then you get this nice frequency distribution over the top 50 tokens. There's one thing to note here. You see that we have the stop words and we set that to English. So stop words are basically just an array of very frequent words and you just exclude them, you just ignore them. 
You can use, for instance, the 500 most frequent words or the 1000 most frequent words and just throw them out. Another side note that is important here is that when doing text with scikit-learn and other libraries, we're commonly using sparse matrices because these vocabulary matrices, they're quite empty, right? A lot of words don't occur in all the documents, so there's a lot of zeros. So rather than allocating really a, let's say, 10,000 words times 5,000 documents matrix, we just use a so-called sparse matrix, which is a key value-based uh, approximation of a matrix. It's much faster because it does not allocate n times n data points, but it just represents them as a dictionary, as a hash in the background. Here is an example on how to use the TFIDF transformer. You have your data, these are different sentences, and the TFIDF transformer, and you combine that with a count vectorizer. So you run fit transform on your data, and then you take that sparse matrix of the counts and you give it to the TFIDF transformer. So now I showed you NLTK, the Natural Language Toolkit, which is quite good for many tasks, but a bit dated. So I would also just like to quickly show you an alternative called Spacey that can be a bit easier to work with, but it's also a bit more computing heavy. And you can install it through pip. And you need to download the language packages for a specific language. And that's quite an advantage because Spacey has a lot of languages that you can support. For instance, if you want to do parsing on German text, or if you want to do parsing on Turkish text, that could be a nice alternative. You can, again, look for the part of speech text. So here, for instance, we have a sentence. Can you process this text? And it again detects the verbs, it detects the nouns, and also the punctuation marks, and the determiners, and the pronouns. But you can also do a bit more advanced stuff. You can do a so-called dependency parse and really compute the tree, the linguistic representation of that particular sentence. So you see here that the verb is always the root, and the verb is connected to a noun subject and an adjective complement. And now I'm going to show you a more advanced representation. As I showed you, there are back of words representations and there are TFIDF representations. But more recently, people started to use so-called word embeddings or word representations. And this is quite a compelling idea. So the idea here is to represent each word by a vector. And this relates to the linguist Firth, who basically described the meaning of a word as the company that it keeps. And it turned out to be one of the most successful ideas in modern statistical natural language processing. As so you say, the usage context of the word really makes the meaning of the word. So here, for instance, we have the word banking related to words like government, like debt, regulation, and then you use them to represent the meaning of the word banking. And what you do is really you represent each word as a vector. And as you know, vectors are just directions in space. So for instance, the word linguistics could be represented like these numbers. So each word is represented by a vector. And as you know, a vector is just a direction in space. And what's quite exciting is that you can then do math and that this math with these vectors actually captures a lot of the meaning between the different words. First, I'd like to show you how these representations are computed. There are two different ways to compute word of vec representation. One is the so-called continuous bag of words. And what you do is you try to predict a particular word, the WT, based on the preceding and the succeeding words. So you predict the current word based on the words left and right to it. 
And you do that many, many times until you get quite good at making that prediction. And then the representation, the parameters in that particular model can be used as vectors and then you can do math with these vectors. There's also an alternative to then, that's a so-called skipgram model. And for that, you take a particular word and you try to predict its context. And again, you can do that with many, many examples. You take a particular word, W, T, and then you predict the words to the left and to the right. And as I said, what's really exciting is that you can do math with these vectors. So in this particular vector space, the vector that goes from man to woman is almost the same as the vector that goes from uncle to aunt or the one from king to queen. So it relates a certain linguistic relationship like gender, for instance. And you can use this now to even solve analogy puzzles. So this not only works for gender, but also for things like plural. And you can use this to answer questions. So you can do an analogy puzzle like a man is to woman as king is to what? And then the system can say queen. And it works really for a large number of examples. So you can also take the vector that goes from China to Beijing. And if you generally just add that vector to the vector representation of the word Germany, you end up in Berlin. If you do it for Italy, you end up in Rome. So it captures a notion of capital city. You can also just look at your model and see for a particular word, what are the words that are most similar to the word. So here's a model that I trained for the word Sweden. And you can see other Nordic countries like Norway, Denmark, and Finland are the most similar vectors. And this is all related to the size of your data set. So the more data you have, the better your web representations are. So here I did some, some analogy puzzles. For instance, England is to London as Germany is to what? And it rightly inferred Berlin. Although Düsseldorf is not really very far from it, so it's not really perfect, but it captures a lot. You also see this for the world leaders. So during the data set, David Cameron was still the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, and if you then typed England is to Cameron, Germany is to what? Then Merkel and Schröder were the most similar. So that's quite interesting. And one thing that I recommend you is to play a bit with this. You find the link here, rare-technologies.com slash word to vec dash tutorial. And you can play with three different things. You can do, you can do these analogy puzzles. That is, what are the relationships between the words that are captured? And you can look at the most similar words. There's also a third task that I didn't show you before. And that's basically you providing four different words and the system detecting which one doesn't fit the line. And what you notice about task one and task three is that they are commonly used in intelligent tests. So here again, we have this Turing test phenomenon where we have a task that is close to what we think is human intelligence. But now that we looked at it, it's just a neural network that learned to predict how similar different words are and how likely they are to occur in a particular context. Now, for this lecture, I have a variety of exercises that I invite you to do because I think it's going to be helpful. The first task that I would like to give you is to load a text file. In the video and in the slides, there are the solutions to that. Then count all the words in a particular file, just so you get a feeling. You can do that by hand, but you can also use the count vectorizer and then visualize the counts. You can, for instance, look at matplotlib and the custom ticker to make it look a bit more pretty. And then, and this is a bit more advanced, explore n-grams, how to compute bigrams of a text, how to compute trigrams of a text, that's the first task that I would like to give you. 
the second task would to plot the counts of the particular words based on the part of speech tags. So look at the most frequent nouns, the most frequent verbs, and the most frequent adjectives, and experiment a bit with sentiment analysis in its most basic form. For that, you can use the Senti word in a database that I showed you. And again, that's a dictionary that has a value for a lot of words in terms of how positive or negative that word is. And you can use that to see, for instance, whether a review of a movie likes the movie or not, or whether a customer on a website like Amazon likes the product or not. That's the so-called sentiment analysis task. And yeah, play with it and have fun and learn something.